this is Thursday's Lessons, where we draw some information and hopefully lessons from things of history or nerdery or, in this particular case, we're going to talk about something, though, that is a problem. Rather than try to draw some wisdom from something, we're going to talk about something that is a problem we're currently having and try to put out the idea of fixing. What we're talking about is prison. And I think most of us can agree that, at the very least, pr our prison system has some problems. Even if you're not well educated on what they are, or you're not sure about what's going on, you can at least see clearly, I think, most everyone can, that there's something up with our prison system. That it's not quite right. And I'm about to go into exactly why that is, what that causes, and what we could do to make that better. So, to begin, let's state what I think to be obvious to a lot of people already, which is that prison, the whole system of incarceration to, you know, serving time is all pretty racially biased. That it's all, let's put it bluntly, just racist against anyone who is not white, quite frankly. The statistics bear it out. In fact, I'm looking at them right now, and if we're looking at the United States incarceration rates by race and ethnicity, circa 2010, the amount of people incarcerated per 100,000 people in that group. With white people, we have 380. For Latinos, we have 966 per 100,000. And for black people, we have a whopping 2,207 per 100,000 people. Now, that is a difference comparing the white and black populations of incarcerated peoples here between 380 and 2,207. Like, that is... Almost the entire difference. When you try and round it, it's like, yeah, 1,900, basically 2,000, basically all of the 2,200. Yeah. That's it the difference between the two. Is all of it, basically. The whole thing. And what does that turn into here? What it turns into is if we look at number of inmates, right? Or the percentage of inmates based on race... Circa 2016, right? With uh, Asians, we have about 2,800, which is 1.5% of the total population. For black people, we have 71,904, which is 37.8% of the prison population. Native Americans contribute to 3,879, about 2%. And white people come in at 111,593 which is 58.7% of that prison population. Now, let's, let's talk about the actual population demographics in the United States to make a comparison, shall we? Now, for non-Hispanic whites, this is a little more specific than my previous set of numbers, but 63.7% of the population is white. Now, contrast that to 12.2% of the population being black. And then contrast that to, while 58.7% of the prison population is white, which is actually under that demographic, right? 37.8%, like I said, of the prison population is black. Compare that to 12.2% of the actual whole population being black. That's a bit of a difference, ain't it? And furthermore, just to take a little stab at private prisons taking in black and Hispanic prisoners at a much higher rate, right? Much higher. And um, basically, these inmates become cheaper to take care of because of quantity. You take in the African-American people, well, you have higher rates of recidivism, you have higher rates of time, you know. They're more likely to serve longer sentences. They're more likely to come back. They're more, see, they get markups from the government. They get breaks based on how many prisoners they have. Taking in a large number of prisoners that are easy to control and considered generally a you know, vulnerable population, if you will, they're easier to, to put it bluntly, they're easier to abuse, they're easier to corral, People get less worked up about injustice onto them, just stating blunt facts. Well, I mean, I was just watching Philosophy Tube's video about uh, race the other day, and it talks about racialization, and the process of racialization includes the kind of thing you're talking about. That yes. In order to racialize people in the first place, they have to lack power in the society, and then they become put into a group based on the fact that they're unruly in the society, ultimately. But yes they're put into that group. Yes, they're being treated as basically a commodity. 
at that point, which is pretty frightening to think about. Prisoners, people being treated as a tradable commodity to that, collect. That's the sick thing about the private prison specifically, of course, is yes. the profit motive of keeping people incarcerated. Of course. And furthermore, before we move on to the next piece here, if you, you know, the, why is that racial issue so important? <laughs> because, well, think about what that's doing. 37% of the prison population is African American, despite the fact that 12% of the actual United States population is of that, you know, color. That's, that's, like, that's like three times more likely. Yes. And that means that those are families being broken up. Whether it's, you know, somebody's wife, somebody's husband, whatever, you know, and father. It tends to be that families are being broken up where you have a single mother who has to work more yeah. in order to provide for her kids. And the family is torn apart. You can't build a community in that way. No, you can't. And so that contributes to the fragmentation of the family unit amongst the African American community right now is because so many of their people are getting arrested it's, and they're spending 10, 20 years in jail. The prison system is perpetuating their minoritization. Yes, completely. I but, mean, there's a whole book on this. Oh, yes. The New Jim Crow that talks about how, I mean, basically, mass incarceration for people of color is the continuation of slavery into current day. Yes. Because it creates a system of disenfranchisement, disempowerment. It creates a lot of things. Now, let's combine that, right? To keep that racial point in mind and combine that with the fact that prisons are very classist. Like, if we look at here percentage points, right? Just look at some raw statistics. I'll drop a big one on you to start. Comparing people that were arrested versus people that were not arrested pre-incarceration, right? Before they were ever arrested, before they were ever thrown in prison, the not arrested category makes 41% more than the people who are going to get arrested. Comparing them before their arrest, the people that are destined, if you will, to get arrested for the purposes of this study are f making 41% less than non-incarcerated people. So you could argue that poor people commit more crimes, but that's not really statistically borne out. Crime sort of goes across a metric, and yet we're having a disproportionate number of wealth-disadvantaged people being thrown in prison. If you want to do comparisons, like the dichotomy, right, is that basically if you look at men versus women, right, men have a 52% difference between incarcerated and non-incarcerated incomes. Remember, again, this is all pre-incarceration, before arrest even entered the picture. And so for blacks, it's 44. Hispanics, it's 34. For whites specifically, it's 54, making it the largest disparity, actually, for white people. 50, they had a 54% income difference between non-incarcerated and incarcerated white males. That is an astoundingly huge number. 54% difference. Are and you going to tell me that doesn't mean anything? Yeah, and this is the thing that I didn't understand when we first looked at these numbers was I thought it was saying that you're making a certain amount before you go into jail and you make this much less after you've been in jail. But no, it's just... Who is the system of being arrested tending to catch in their net? And it's poor people. Overwhelmingly, people with less income are more likely to get arrested, just as a general rule. The more you make, the less likely you are to get arrested. And I don't think that speaks to the moral character of wealth. I think that speaks to the power and advantage of wealth and how much our prison system respects it. Now, moving on, right? What happens if you get arrested? You get, let's say you become a felon, right? Ooh. We all know that, at least, you know, most of us know that most states restrict felons' abilities to buy guns. Now, it does vary from state to state, and it's a very complicated issue that I'm not going to start listing off because of just how complicated it is and how you have to parse out these laws because many states have specific things. If you're convicted of this type of felony, you can't get this versus this, but... Basically, look at it as this way. First off, if you become a felon, there is going to be some form of restriction or complete ban placed on your ability to own firearms. 
you may or may not be able to get that rescinded. Now that, to some people, is a big deal, not to others. But let's talk about the big deal, in my opinion. Enfranchisement and disenfranchisement. In this case, literally, the ability to vote. Your say in your system of government. You can lose that. Now, only two states in the Union always let you keep your right to vote, even while incarcerated, and that belongs to Maine and Vermont. There's quite a few states that will give it after release, but the largest number requires um, you to actually complete parole and probation in addition to sentence to get it back. Now, we still have states here, nine of them to be specific, that only restore them with a governor's pardon or court action, a.k.a. you only get those rights back if the governor signs off on it or the court overturns your conviction. Meaning, effectively, that's a permanent ban on your right to vote. I didn't even know that was a thing prior to preparing for this show, that you could actually... I, I knew that you could lose your right to vote when you went into prison. I knew that was a problem and that... That was something that needed to be addressed. I didn't know that automatic restoration after completion of your sentence wasn't just how it worked on a federal level or something. No. And here's the thing. This is recent that there's been so many states that allow this. What, that allow people to actually vote? Yeah, after they're being... Uh, being a felon. Uh -huh. And between 1996 and 2008, seven states repealed lifetime disenfranchisement laws, at least for some ex-offenders. So that means recently, since 1996, seven states have rescinded a permanent ban. Meaning that this is a very recent phenomenon, actually, that felons could vote. This is still being fought mm -hmm. in quite a few places. Virginia, mm -hmm. <laughs> our home state, being one of them there. It is pretty shameful, I have to say, because, uh, quite honestly, when we look at the idea of a prisoner, right, they're paying a debt to society, quote-unquote, serving the time, paying the, your, you know, punishment, basically, that you're done, right? You have paid your time. Your punishment is over. Now it's time to reintegrate and do all this stuff, except you've taken away these people's rights in certain cases, in many cases, whether it's the right to own a gun, the ability to be employed, moving to that point, where if we look at the studies here, there's lots of studies done on this issue, actually, of the felon's ability to get employed, because that's the big point, isn't it, we want from our former criminals is to get back into society and become what? What's the tired old fucking adage everyone says? Become productive members of society. What does that mean? Get a job, right? Yet when we look at the odds of a felon getting a job, it drops, statistically speaking, right? Between 15 to 30 percent reduction in their ability to be hired and the reduction in their annual number of weeks worked by 6 to 11 weeks. Wait, wait, wait. So... We were already ensnaring a disproportionate number of poor people in our net. Yes. And now we're spitting them back out, less able to get work. Yes, with the red flag, the scarlet letter of felon. Uh, felony conviction on an employer's willingness to hire found that 80 to 90 percent of employers said they would hire, quote unquote, former welfare recipients, workers with little recent job experience or lengthy unemployment, and other stigmatizing characteristics, end quote. But only around 40 percent said they would consider hiring job applicants with criminal histories. Even fewer would consider ex offenders for jobs involving customer service or handling money. Mm. The stigmatizing effect was true even when researchers used actors and carefully crafted resumes to eliminate the effect of any other variable other than the sole fact of a prior felony conviction. And so if you get a felony <clears throat> specifically, that's also going to disproportionately affect your ability to get especially the kinds of jobs that you would have in lower income brackets. Exactly. So it becomes, what's this thing? A, a cycle? cycle. And what does this lead to? Let, let, well, why does this segue so well and perfectly, doesn't it? Uh -huh. Because it segues into the national statistics on recidivism that I'm going to bring up. And for those who don't know, recidivism is basically a fancy word for the odds of a criminal recommitting a crime. That is, to be recidivist is to commit a second crime after committing another one, or a first one. So, Repeat this is for the United States of America. Within three years of release 
about two-thirds of released prisoners were rearrested. Now, within five years of release, about three-quarters, 76.6% to be exact, of prisoners that were released were rearrested. Of those prisoners who were rearrested, more than half were arrested again. Like, were arrested by the end of the first year. Mm -hmm. So, so we, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> so, the prison system takes in poor people, spits them out less able to get work, and more likely to reoffend. Yeah. And what is this word? You, you just used it. Cycle. What does that sound like? A bigger cycle inside of a smaller one. Like, that this contributes to basically the revolving door prison, if you've ever heard that term. That's what it's referring to. The idea that prisoners are just going in and out and in and out and in and out. And you're not really ever fixing the problem. You're not ever really solving criminality. You're just basically having them play musical chairs with prisons. And what does that really do? Well, I'll tell you what it does, you know, to people. It makes them prone to being grabbed by extremism, for one thing. And a side note before I get to this point. Huh? Cults do the same thing with prisoners. They offer them a sense of belonging in a world that otherwise seems kind of hostile, right? You're, you're a convicted felon, right? Let's say you're a reformed convicted felon. You really want to go out there and be a productive member of society. But people are going to most likely see you as whatever that conviction is. That's you now. And then a cult comes along, right? But they don't really introduce themselves as a cult, of course. They just sort of, hey, we're here for you. We, we can help find you some jobs here. You know, we have a place you can stay. Get you back on your feet, you know? These people seem like some real nice people all of a sudden. When you were down and out bad on your luck and the system that you're trying to work with won't help you at all, all of a sudden these people seem nice. And then when they're your friends. When they literally save you? Yeah. When they literally save you from going back to jail, because that's the only thing that seems to work, is, oh, well, stealing work. No one wants to give me a real job. Yeah, so let's note on that recidivism. Yeah, one of the biggest reasons that happens is because no one wants to hire them. And so they need money to get back on their feet. No one wants to hire them. God, didn't they even make this the premise of, like, Ant-Man? <laughs> it's such a thing that the guy goes back to committing crimes because he can't find legitimate work. Oh, it's like it's almost so well known that it's a trope. Right, that. Now, replace cult and everything I just said with radical extremist. It's the same exact thing. Do you think the radical extremists go to them and just scream jihad at them until they want to kill people? No. They hand them literature. They pray with them if it's an Islamic extremist. If it's a white nationalist, they offer them protection from the blacks or whatever. They often extend a hand in friendship first. It's, it's never the final cause that they start with. And so, hey, you're down on your luck. You're either in prison or just out of prison. Hey, man, we can help you. We know some people. We can get you a job. We know a guy who can rent you a room. You know, just pray with us. Or, hey, just read this book or something, you know. And that's where it begins. And once you're indebted to a person, you're more likely to listen to them. You're more likely to think they're correct. It's just a human logical thing. You're more likely to think well of people that have done you favors. <laughs> and so they keep doing you favors. They become the only people you turn to. In fact, I can attest to this, having seen it myself a few times, actually. I've known some people that have done some time in prison, like real time, a few years. And almost in every case have they come out in some way far more radicalized in their beliefs. Two of them became very, you know, racist. <laughs> very racist. In both cases, or at least in one of them I can say for sure, he went in there already leaning racist, but I don't, it's not benign racism, but that's sort of like half-hearted racism. That, yeah, you know, i probably say a black person's more likely to commit crimes, but it doesn't really affect my daily living. I don't generally act on this racist tendency. He's one of those guys who lives in a racially hegemonic yeah. community, basically, and so he doesn't have to deal with the fact that he has negative attitudes. Right, and he's, it's not really... There, there's no hate behind them, though. There's not really any hate, it's just more learned prejudice, yeah. basically. 
And, you know, I tried to do what I could to help him there. And he generally wanted to learn more and all that. But after coming out of prison, where he had signed up with the Aryan Brotherhood, because at one point, from what I understood, he started the fight even. But a basically, he got in a fight with a black guy there. And he sort of, because of the underlying racist tendencies, decided that he needed protection. And so he went to the, you know, white nationals, the Aryan Brotherhood. And what did they do? They didn't start out with, you know, kill all black people with them. No, they started with, we are an empowerment for white people. They started with, we're here to help white people. We're not here to hate the black people. We're here to help white people. And they started with nice rhetoric and, you know, yeah, we'll fight people if we have to, but we're just protecting ourselves. We're not violent. We just protect us. And it sounded almost lofty in a way. Yeah, sure, misguided by racial superiority ideas, but almost, you know, hey, they got some good ideas almost, right? You know, if they could just kick the racist part, these could be some cool guys. But it's all a front. But they do it slowly. They do it methodically. Where one piece at a time, the ideology changes from, yeah, no, we're not about hurting black people, too. We're only about hurting the black people that are a threat to white people. To, we're about hurting the black people that stand up to us too much. To, we're about hurting the black people. Because they're a threat to us. Oh, no, just period. We're about hurting the black people. (laughs) That's where it ends. But it, or, you know, take it to the Muslim extremists, because that's a big phenomenon going on right now in American prisons, is Muslim extremist conversion. Because, again, what do they say? Hey, we have some answers for you. You're confused. You don't know what to do, and you're not sure about your place in your life. Well, we have some answers for you. Here, just read the Quran. Here, pray with us. And then, maybe it's a good thing. If they're not extremists, you have somebody maybe find some faith in Allah. Maybe that's what they needed to keep themselves in check and to be, you know, a productive member of society that could live comfortably. Maybe that's what they needed. But in many other cases, you have that turn into, just like with the races, that one piece at a time change to, oh no, we're just about protecting the faith, to we're about only fighting the infidels who try to attack us, to we're about fighting the infidels. It's, it just reduces to a simplistic and horrible idea, what was once something that could almost be sort of lofty, the way they sort of mangled it. <laughs> and we create that. We create all of that with the prison system, that sense of disenfranchisement, that sense of disempowerment, that sense that the system has turned its back on you. And once it has turned its back on you, there's this feeling that it won't ever look back for you, that it's not going to turn around and say, hey, I've neglected you long enough. You've done your time. Here you go. Here's my hand. No. It always feels like, amongst almost everybody I've known, I work in kitchens, I've known a lot of people that have done time. (laughs) It's just a reality. Kitchen work is more porous, if you will, more accepting of people with criminal histories. And some of the best people I've worked with have been like, one of them was a 10-year convicted felon for smuggling crack. (laughs) And yeah, he was a great guy. He never touched crack again. Fixed his life up, but it was no thanks to the system. He'd tell you all about it, how he basically had to work himself up, you know, to a minimum wage construction until he got an in with somebody, one of his friends who happened to get in in a kitchen. He got in and worked his way up for another eight years just to make, you know, what I was coming in at. And the system didn't help him. The system doesn't help prisoners right now, nor does the society. Our society doesn't admit that our prison system is a failure. Only very recently have we had... Well, any resistance to the idea of mass incarceration, crime, and punishment working. I mean, the whole reason that we have to do this episode in the first place is because so many people live in the fog... Of illusion. The last episode. ...just makes up the idea that criminals are all this. Stereotyped. Now, I read an article from Fox. I'm not going to bring up the specific article because it was garbage. But it brought up one point of the failure of people's thinking on this issue. They think of this issue as criminals evaluating a circumstance by rational cause and effect based on the greater sociological effects in play. They sit there and view a criminal as contemplating their crime versus the time they might serve. 
Like but putting it through a difference engine. And thinking, if I make the numbers big enough, the difference engine will conclude the crime doesn't pay suddenly. If I make that number of the number of time served, basically, that year number high enough, their difference engine will finally return the result of not worth it. But nobody commits crimes fucking that way. Nobody commits a crime sitting there thinking, well, you know, there's a very good chance I'll get caught for this. So I really should... No, they're not even doing that. That doesn't even enter their mind. Everybody who commits a crime, basically always, unless it's a crime of passion, commits it believing they're going to get away with it. Let's think about it. Who commits a crime thinking, yeah, well, I'm about to do 10 years in jail, unless they have a passion to do it. And then when they have a passion to do it, they don't care about the time served. A murder in passion? When you when a guy pulls out a gun in the middle of an argument and guns someone down, do you think he sat there for a moment and did a rational decision-making process to go, you know, I am very upset at this person who has said things to me that I find to be offensive. I believe that 15 years in jail is worth my permanently silencing him. No. They, don't, they pull out the gun and shoot him. Humans don't tend to be rational actors. No. And viewing them like they are is dumb. (laughs) It's saying that people who are committing a crime are being logical and reasonable while doing so. And that is rarely the case. You usually find that actually in white-collar crime. But then again, are they thinking about their chances of getting arrested in a realistic manner? Probably not. I'm so smart. Look at how I'm doing this particularly clever method of taking money. No one will ever catch me. Look at the Ponzi scheme. Why do those always spiral out of control? Because people think they're not going to get caught. They get drunk on success. And so they just keep committing the crime. And our system does nothing to discourage that. Yeah, you know, prison's not a good thing. But because of the extensiveness of prison, I can comfortably say that there's a whole culture that grows up around the idea of respecting prison as a mark of adulthood. A gang culture, in specific, but more generally, a very poor, disenfranchised culture that sees prison as sort of an initiation, right? We are the people that go to prison. You're not an adult until you've done it. That's a hell of a label to take, and that's a hell of a label to force on people. But going all the way back to the beginning, where I cited all of that wall of statistics and facts, right? We are disproportionately targeting certain groups of people. So should we at all be surprised that those groups of people start labeling themselves by that? That we have disproportionately made them into that? Criminals. And so they start seeing themselves as what? Criminals. It's very simple. You treat a man like a monster long enough, a monster he becomes. And what do prisons do? They treat men like animals, keep them in cages, disrespect them, and take away basic human dignity. And most of our society gets off on this idea, even. Look at any comment section under any news article about somebody getting arrested for committing a crime. Any crime, really. Unless it's some kind of humanitarian or empathy crime. Like someone steals something. Even just something random. They just stole something that they didn't need, right? You're going to see people talking about locking them up, some people mentioning the cutting of the hand of the thief, people talking about whipping and lashing. Oh, you have somebody who commit murder. Oh, then suddenly the comment section becomes an expose on torture. Just try and count the number of internet tough guys that will show up. Yeah. When we look at the idea of criminals coming out of prison and recommitting their crimes because they don't see an alternative. We need to kind of turn the camera back to us and say, why do we have such a raging desire in society to personally destroy anybody who breaks the law with a zeal that is unhealthy? Oh, you, you, you know, this guy was a crack dealer. Well, let me at him and I'll rip his skin off. Like, what the holy fuck, people? This month, like that right there, that shit needs to just stop. That's not healthy. And instead, we need to keep in mind something very important, some basic truth that has been lost in our criminal justice system, as it were, that criminals are human beings. They're products of choices, yes. And maybe those choices were bad, but they're also products of an environment. Well, have we ever had a prison system that actually treated them like they were humans? No. 
not in this country ever. And in fact, the fact that our prison system, as deplorable as it is now, is a wonderful blessing compared to what it used to be. And here's the funny thing, right? With all that bluster and talk about how we would rip prisoners' balls off and whatever, you know, and throw them in prison until they fucking turn into a skeleton and all that, does that actually do anything? Does that, you know, really actually protect us? Well, we already talked about how prisoners don't exactly go through, you know, while committing their crimes, the most logical of thought processes, especially when we're talking about, you know, drug convictions. Do you think a crack addict is honestly thinking about what prison time they're going to do when they are strung out and trying to steal money to feed their addiction? No, they are not thinking of anything but their addiction. Do you think any addict who has gotten to the point where they've done this illegal thing for long enough to be addicted to it, is concerned at all about the law surrounding it. No, because they've turned their life into law-breaking. So the law is something to be disregarded as a matter of course. Like, that's just what you do when you wake up then. So of course the law becomes less important. Well, of course at that point, the punishment isn't a deterrent. No, because they're going to come out And what are they going to do unless they've been actually given drug treatment, unless they've actually been given therapy and help? What are they going to do? Go out and smoke crack or their drug of choice, whatever it is. That's probably the first thing they're going to fucking do. You haven't done anything except put pause on it briefly. Apparently, 75% of the time inside of five years, they're going to go back. They're going to have been rearrested for it, much less will they have actually been just doing it by itself. So a nice study here, right? A deterrence in criminal justice, evaluating certainty versus severity of punishment, right? Link, of course, will be below for it. But I really just want to note on the conclusion. Existing evidence does not support any significant public safety benefit of the practice of increasing the severity of sentences by imposing longer prison terms. In fact, research findings imply that increasingly lengthy prison terms are counterproductive. Overall, the evidence indicates that the deterrent effect of lengthy prison sentences would not be substantially diminished if punishments were reduced from their current levels. Thus, policies such as California's three strikes law or mandatory minimums that increase imprisonment not only burden state budgets but also fail to enhance public safety. As a result, such policies are not justifiable based on their ability to deter. Now, I'm going to go ahead and read the second paragraph because I think this perfectly segues into what we're going to hit on next and is just something that needs to be said. Based on existing evidence, both crime and imprisonment can be simultaneously reduced if policymakers reconsider their over-reliance on severity-based policies such as long prison sentences. Instead, an evidence-based approach would entail increasing the certainty of punishment by improving the likelihood that criminal behavior would be detected. Such an approach would also free up resources devoted to incarceration and allow for increased initiatives of prevention and treatment. Prevention and treatment. Two very important words. Oh, yes. First off, though, I want to note on their idea of detection Mm -hmm. because... That's part of prevention. Yes, that is a big part of prevention. See, how many people, honestly, when they break their small laws, because we all do it in some small way, you know? Wasn't there a book, Four Felonies a Day? Yeah. When you do it, you just think, well, I'm not going to get caught. It's like when you run that red light when no one's around. We are at our most morally vulnerable when we are alone, when we feel unwatched, unperceived by others. A study done involving basically an honesty box aside a coffee maker put into an office as an experiment. Basically, they were just told, hey, here's a coffee maker, put in some money, contribute when you can, you know. And one of them, I think, had a cat face on it, just like a design, right? The other had a single, like, eye. And the one that had the eye on it got three times the donations as the one with the cutesy design. Why? Because when we're reminded of the fact that other people judge us based on what they see us doing, we for a moment think, hmm, what would this other person, this hypothetical coworker slash, you know, fellow human, think of me if they saw me engaging in this behavior? 
So for a moment, this person has to take themselves out of their own preconceptions, their own ideas that totally justify whatever they were about to do, such as not paying, and think, well, what if this other person who doesn't have any of these particular preconceptions, thoughts, and feelings saw me doing this? Well, they would think I'm an asshole. Well, maybe I shouldn't do that because of their judgment. And see, that is more important to deterring crime, I think, than punishment itself is the social element. The idea that committing a crime has social ramifications, that we police each other in a way. My understanding is that what punishment tends to do, like just on an individual basis, is that you tend to be more secretive yes. in the future. Well, ask any 14-year-old kid who's been punished by his parents. Did he stop the behavior or did he get smarter with the behavior? Exactly. And you know what the answer's going to be because each one of you been there. You get smarter with it. Because punishment doesn't work. No, because punishment creates resentment. Because it's just a, with the way the human mind works, we justify what we do. So if you committed a crime, you probably in some way feel justified in having committed it. Whether it's you robbed somebody because they cheated you or, you know, you stole from this business because you feel like, you know, you're entitled to a living without working or whatever conceptions you've built up in your head, they justify the crime in some way, even if not completely, to you. And so the punishment will basically always feel unwarranted. But I had a reason, says everybody ever in jail. And they believe it. And even if you think that's wrong, that doesn't change the fact that they believe it and thus they're going to feel that the punishment they're enduring is ornarious and burdening based on the crime they committed. Do you think the average person would honestly commit most of the crimes they do if they actually did take that step back and say, you know, this could very likely result in me spending 5 to 15 years in prison? No, they probably wouldn't. But this isn't an ideal world and people don't do that. They don't think that way, especially in the heat of the moment. Or if basically at all, look at every white collar criminal, every person who pulls off a ridiculous Ponzi scheme and gets caught almost immediately saying they were totally going to get away with it. Nobody thinks they're going to get caught. And so when we do arrest people, <clears throat> we need to understand that it's not about punishment. It's about what? Treatment. That they have something wrong, basically. Whether a defective idea about the society, their morals might be, you know, not in line with ours, however you want to put it, right? There's another way to do it other than punishment. I want to point to Norway here, you know. Hi, Norway, you get a prize. <laughs> um, basically, in Norway, fewer than 4,000 of the country's 5 million people were behind bars. That makes Norway's incarceration rate just 75 per 100,000 people. By the way, just white people in the U.S. alone, 380. 2,200. Add those numbers together per 100,000 people, and the entirety of Norway beats that. Beats any single category of that. And it has the lowest, one of the lowest residual recidivism rates in the world at 20%. And again, just for everybody playing along, that U.S. recidivism rate is 76.6% .6 within five years. Holy shit. Something's different, isn't it? <laughs> the result. The result of prison there. Why? Well, this is not even a point of argument, actually. So many studies have been done on this. Google it. Fucking Google it. Just look at it what Norway is doing and the other people that have taken their type of what is apparently called restorative justice, the idea of treating prisoners not like people to be punished, but like people to be rehabilitated, to be reformed. Wait, wait, wait. Are you saying we're trying to help people? Yes. Because isn't the idea here, just, I'm, I'm, you know, just throwing something out there, isn't the idea here to stop crime? I thought so. I mean, that's what I was under the impression of, that we wanted to stop crime. Well, I think that primarily what people wanted was for criminals to suffer. Right. But I think we should be worried about stopping crime, preventing crime from needing to even happen. 
Wait, could you imagine that? Preventing people from even needing to suffer in the first place? Right. But, you know, we don't live in a perfect world. So what's the best we could do right now? Taking the people that have, for whatever reason, decided to commit crimes and giving them better choices. Because often crime is a failure of options. It is a feeling of not having more options. I'm going to rob this person because I don't know how I'm making a living. Thus, a failure of options. They don't see a reasonable alternative to crime. And maybe there are alternatives that they aren't aware of or don't understand. But that's as much a problem to be fixed as just not understanding the options altogether. Or how about the people that don't have the options? They give people training in Norway's prisons. Give them job skills. So that, you know, when they come out of prison, rather than being a pariah to all working economy, they are a desirable person. Because, hey, oh, you spent time in prison? What skills did you learn? Oh, you learned how to become a carpenter in prison. You have three years of carpentry now. Okay, you are hireable. Because I don't think there was much distracting you from your carpentry lessons in there. <laughs> I think you're going to be at least a decent carpenter now. It's something we understand except for prisoners. Give a man a fish. Feed him for a day, right? Teach a man to fish. Feed him for a lifetime. It's a basic stupid fucking saying. Teach a prisoner how to not commit crimes. How to survive other ways. And they don't have to commit crimes. It's like I'm like talking tautologically now. You stick them in a room as opposed to a cage. Well, it's that point of if you lock a man in a cage and treat him like an animal, that's what he'll become. Because, again, he has no alternatives. You're not giving him a choice. You're saying this is it. This is what you have and there's nothing you can do about it. And this is who you are now. So, yeah, of course they become what we tell them they are if we give them no choice but to do it. And you can say, yeah, you know, people can come out of prison better they can, yes. But the system should be organized in such a way that the most people do. That should be the goal of the system, not a happenstance occurrence that happens sometimes because of a person's will. That should be something the system no, wants to engender. No, no, see, you're trying to take personal responsibility out of it, you fucking communist. Personal responsibility should be applied, yes. But what does responsibility mean? What is the level of responsibility we're talking about? It's not that they're it's not about, taking responsibility. It's that we're applying the idea of the responsibility of all crime to each person, basically. We're treating every criminal like a filthy rapist drug addict monster. Oh, you're a prisoner? Oh, well, who did you kill? No, you could be in prison for you could be in prison for smoking weed. Oh, I, I had like an ounce of weed on me. No, you are a filthy rapist monster. You were in prison oh well you must have done something awful so you're dehumanized not only in the system while you're there you're dehumanized afterwards you're not a person you're a felon you're a criminal a dirty thieving lying criminal that's why you can't vote of course because nobody ever makes mistakes nobody ever in a moment of desperation does something that they regret Oh, wait, that's like everybody in the world. Some people just don't do that thing in such a manner that they go to jail. Hell, it's like even the people that you've yelled at somebody you cared about over something stupid. At least once in your life, everybody literally has done that, ever. And that's a point there. That is a mistake. As soon as you could think about it later, you didn't want to do that, really. But wait, you did something that in retrospect, you didn't want to do. A mistake, a failure of cognitive thinking. If we apply this further to people, that this can happen anywhere and not just in talking, then people could make criminal mistakes in a moment that they, in their own minds currently, could look back in a more rational moment and go, that was stupid and I really shouldn't have done that. You're trying to give criminals the benefit of the doubt? I'm trying to give everyone benefit of the doubt because anyone could be a criminal. You're trying to treat criminals like they're human beings. Yes, I am, because they are. And yes, that includes even the worst of criminals. People be like, oh, well, you know, I love that argument. You'd change your mind about this if you had someone who was victimized. It's like, well, if I was, I'll go ahead and say it, if I was weak, yeah. If I was weak in my conviction on this principle, yeah. Oh, well, someone I knew got shot. Well, then now all criminals need to burn. No, no, that's not logical. That's hateful. That's giving into anger. 
that informs that now. That's not, that doesn't make that more logical or reasonable. That makes that more personal. And yeah, that can, you know, I'm not saying that, oh, all criminals are great people and you just need to give them a chance. No, no, that's why jail no. exists. No. It's not for punishment, but for isolation. It is, if you cannot rehabilitate somebody, you imprison them to prevent them from harming people. You're not saying all prisoners are great people. You're saying all prisoners are people. I'm saying all prisoners are people with all that that entails. Basic dignity, treatment, rights. And, and Norway, to my understanding, won't even extradite people to the U.S. No, they won't. At least as far... That could have changed, but at least as far as I'm aware of... They wouldn't do it because of the state <coughs> of the U.S. prison system relative to theirs. It's like human rights violations type stuff. Now, here's a, a quote, right, from um, the governor in one of the places doing this experiment in Norway. Mm -hmm. He says, in closed prisons, we keep them locked up for some years and then let them back out, not having had any real responsibility for working or cooking. In the law, being sent to prison has nothing to do with putting you in a terrible prison to make you suffer. The punishment is that you lose your freedom. If we treat people like animals when they are in prison, they are likely to behave like animals. Here, we pay attention to you as human beings. This says everything we were just saying. And I'm not saying don't punish at all. But the punishment needs to be specific and designed to engender results that matter. The people punishment that, needs to serve a purpose. Yes, yeah, it's like the people that just spank their kids when they're disobedient. That doesn't serve a purpose other than using the power of force. It's saying, I can make you behave with my power. Did that teach that kid why they should behave once that power is removed? No. No, they can be a dick as long as they want. As long as it doesn't come back to the man with the fist. It just teaches them again what? To be secretive, to be clever. No, no, if you teach them why the bad thing is bad and should not be done, and then what? Give them better alternatives to get the things they want, then doing the bad thing. Then what? Whether the person who is there to administer the punishment is there or not, they'll do the right thing because they're no longer following the law out of fear of punishment, but out of knowledge of the right way. Because we should not expect people to follow the law out of fear. Because the moment, even fucking Machiavelli talked about the rule of fear. Fear gives way to hate. And when someone hates you, they will not listen to you. They will not fear you anymore. And fear also gives way to secrecy. When someone is afraid of you, they are likely to take clandestine action against you rather than overt. Doesn't mean they're not going to take action or that they're cowed by their fear. No, it just means their action will be different. No, no. You teach them how to be better at life. You teach them, oh, well, this is what you did before. You were stealing cars to make money. We can teach you how to use that skill to work on cars and make money. You're a burglar. Well, then, we're going to teach you how to work with, I don't know, home security. We can teach you how to use your former knowledge to protect people from that. Any number of things. You can always give somebody a construction job and experience with nothing else. Here's how to pour concrete, lay bricks. Here, you're a mason. That pays decent, at least, and it's good, solid work. The whole point is that, again, that tired old phrase, they become productive members of society. Yeah, if you help them. And we're so much of a bootstraps country that we don't believe in helping anybody, I know. <laughs> but Which is kind of the real problem. Right, but... At least in this context, if nowhere else, we could prevent so much harm that happens in this country by empowering prisoners with options that aren't criminal. Saying, hey, look, here, this is a way for you to not be a criminal and make good money, be productive, and have some pride in yourself, and be on the right side of the law. Here you go. And it's not charity, because they're still working. They're doing a job that produces things or does a service for people, which is all we can really expect of people if we want them to be productive members of society, right? Work for the betterment of others and participate in the system of economics that we are all a part of, you know, legally. And if they're doing that, we've succeeded because then they're not a criminal. Thus, the criminal justice system basically works to right itself out of need. The... 
absurdity of our system relative to Norway's is demonstrated perfectly by that story of someone who committed a crime and was scheduled to go to prison, but never showed up, and that never showed up in the system, so they never went to pick him up. And so he spent the next, like, 20-some years just living his life, but living it productively. Um, I may have been a small business owner or something. At the very least, he was a manager or some kind. Uh, he was active in the community, and he had turned his life around, so to speak, right? Yeah. And then they catch up with him. And it's like, what is the point, then, of administering the punishment of putting him in prison for the crime he committed when he's already done the thing we should have wanted in the first place? Yeah. He didn't continue a life of crime and instead became a productive member of society. And I want to go ahead and address something before we close, right? Sure. Because I can already hear it in my head, the people saying, well, what about the victims? What about their justice? And that is actually an important point to bring up. Because a victim has been wronged, and, well, they do deserve something for being wrong. That's how society works, is wrongs deserve, you know, rights, basically. Justice. Yeah, justice. It's a complicated word for it. But to that argument, I say, vengeance is not the answer. Everyone needs to accept that. Revenge is not a solution. You have been wronged, yes. Hell, I've been the victim of crime. <laughs> had my face bashed in but vengeance is not the answer not really because it doesn't do anything beyond make you feel better for a moment maybe if you're lucky we think that taking vengeance is going to make us feel better and we believe it about other people who have taken vengeance that they must feel better we write it in our stories that he took vengeance and finally felt free like, Ooh, this is another example of where media is skewing our ideas yes, of what it reality is. actually is. Oh, yeah, since ancient times. Mm -hmm. How many great epics began as a quest of revenge? Okay. It's, a, it's a pervasive feeling in our society that, quite frankly, is all of this. In a nutshell, that idea of vengeance. That idea of needing to hurt the person who hurt us in some kind of quest for a feeling of power, a feeling of rightness that will never come from that. So we continue to hurt the criminals, hoping to one day feel that rightness and closure. It'll never happen. We'll never get it. But we'll keep hurting them until we do. And when the idea is harm reduction? Then vengeance increases the net harm. It's the simple equation of that math there. Ethically speaking, vengeance is harming another because you were harmed. That is not reduction of harm. In fact, well, it's a cycle. Yes, it's a cycle. People in jail often have justified to themselves their own crimes. That's why education's so important. Because in their current mindset, many of them feel like they had a reason for what they did that made it okay. And when you punish them without any education, without any lessons, without any furtherance of their person what they're going to be left with is i committed x crime like i shot at this person but because of ignorant ideas i had because you know let's say i'm a racist right for this example i shot at a black guy and they arrested me i felt like i was shooting at him because oh he was walking up on me and they're they're all like gang members and violent so i had to shoot him to protect myself now there's a chance you could educate somebody right have them in prison, give them some education, teach them about things, broaden their horizons, and they could come out with a different worldview. Now, you just lock that person up with none of that and just throw them in jail. They're going to sit there and say, well, the system's punishing me for protecting myself. I see how it is. Do you think they're going to learn from that realization anything other than I was right and I just need to do it better? <laughs> no, they're not because they have no reason to. And... For all the people out there that are still clamoring for vengeance, right? This isn't about you. Sorry to say it. You might have been wronged by a prisoner. And, you know, I feel for you. But this isn't actually about you personally. This is about society. This is about the greater good of all of us. About reduction of harm to society by preventable elements. And if we can prevent that, if we can work in a more humanitarian and compassionate way to prevent 
crime from happening altogether. Like, if we can just turn a person from being a criminal into a non-offender and make that a permanent life choice because they have better options, that's another person not committing crimes. That's more people protected from potential crime. Those are victims that didn't happen. And that, to me, is an ultimate good. And the more people we can take from these disastrous life choices and put back on a better path, the less criminals we have. And then the less perception we have of criminality being such a red letter. It's become something recoverable, a mistake. And then not only does that prevent the society from alienating and isolating the former offenders, it prevents them from demonizing themselves. Because... How many of them sit there and must think to themselves, I am a monster. I am. I just must be a bad person. They keep telling me I'm a bad person. They treat me like shit. They beat me. I must be a terrible person. They internalize that. And then, well, this is what they they think of me. This is what I am. And then they become that. Because that's what they're told they are. And it's beaten into them, sometimes quite literally. So, of course, they do that. Mm. And to put a little capstone on this from the Norway article, right? This is that perspective put in the um, governor's words, that governor I quoted before. And it's everything I was just saying, but put in just a few words. Americans want their prisoners punished first and rehabilitated second, if at all, I would add. But the fact that that even comes in second, because that's the real goal here. That's the real harm prevention part of this. Punishment is itself nothing. It is harm done to feel better, basically. No, no. Rehabilitation is where we prevent harm from happening. And that's what needs to be the focus of this. Just saying. That needs to be the goal of the system. You know what? I think I just thought of a neat little pebble to leave in people's shoes before we, uh, like, or as our conclusion. Which is, some people would say, well, if we had a a prison system like Norway's, then why wouldn't everybody just get themselves arrested? What does that say about the society what does it say about the person saying that yeah right that they want a free ticket right yeah also let me put a final note again (laughs) we always do that i know but it's the point here they make at the end that you know basically all the inmates in norwegian prison are going back to the society do you want people who are angry or people who are rehabilitated simple question real simple answer i think We need to make better choices as a society. Yes, to protect ourselves from our own bad choices. (laughs) 